Good afternoon, welcome back. Um, next up, we have uh, project, uh, Pratik Rajesh Sampat and Gautam Shinoy uh, presenting on CPU namespaces, a mechanism to isolate CPU topology information in the Linux kernel. Uh, Pratik is a Linux kernel developer at IBM who works primarily with uh, schedulers and energy management, but also on container primitives. And Gautam is a kernel programmer who has been working on the kernel since 2006 and has contributed to hot plug, process scheduling, RCU, lock depth, CPU idle, and other things. Um, so please welcome them as they present on CPU namespaces. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, I am Pratik Sampat and I work for the Linux Technology Center at IBM. Uh, with me, I have Gautam Shanoi who works with the kernel team at AMD and today we are here to talk about the isolation of CPU information in the Linux kernel. Uh, the agenda for our talk really is uh, that uh, we'll first highlight the question of what is the purpose of sys and proc in the world of containers and are there any implications of exposing this information. Next, we'll talk about some existing solutions that help mitigate this problem. We then present our stab at a solution uh, called the CPU namespace, uh, some experiments around it, and finally we pose questions around the challenges that, are, uh, that exist in this space. All right, motivation. So, uh, a short introduction to SysFS is that it's a file system that uh, is used to expose kernel information to user space, and often it's about kernel subsystems and the hardware that runs it. Uh, applications today can look at this interface to determine system resources, and they can make decisions based on that, such as allocating resources like memory and spawning threads. Uh, take an example of containers. Uh, containerized applications can be restricted via C groups uh, CPU set. However, uh, they can be unaware of these restrictions and can still look at traditional interfaces of sys and proc to make decisions uh, ab about their applications. Now this problem is not only uh, con constrained to the realm of containers, but uh, but outside containers as well. If you take say task set, uh, like the system called sked uh, set affinity, you can use it to uh, set CPU restrictions on applications, but applications may still choose to make uh, their decisions based on looking at uh, sys and proc. So the question that arises from all of this is that uh, what does sys and proc really mean in the context of container restriction? And second, uh, what are really the implications of exposing this information when applications can only use a very small set of it? For the scope of this discussion, we will stick to the implications of CPU resources. However, we will also periodically call out other potential problems such as memory as well. So coming to the first implication, uh, restrictions can be set through interfaces uh, like C group CPU set, as I've already said. However, there are multiple interfaces which display CPU information, and these control and display interfaces may be disjoint from one another. For example, uh, you can see that if a host system has about 128 CPUs, and it spawns a container with its restriction set to 32 to 35 CPUs. Now, this restriction is set through the C group FS itself, and uh, and viewing this interface within the container uh, yields uh, the right uh, 32 to 35 CPUs. A task within this container, if it calls this get uh, get affinity onto it, uh, also gets the right uh, uh, view or the right uh, view of the restriction that has been applied to it. However, if it uh, looks at the proc slash stat, which is generally for the load statistics and uh, and applications like uh, top and edge top use it, you will see uh, you will see data about all the uh, CPUs. And similarly for sysfs as well, uh, you if you look at sys devices system CPU, which is normally used by n proc and LS CPU kind of utilities, and they also show uh, that uh, that 120, uh, you know, eight CPUs uh, exist on the system. So, uh, another, uh, uh, you know, we will talk about the potential impact uh, in terms of performance of, of 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 what this really means in that in that context in in the coming few slides. Uh, you know, next coming to the uh, to another implication of fair use. So. When an application uh, that is running within a container is restricted to some resources, should they still be able to see the entire system resources? Uh, and uh, if so, can this uh, knowledge be potentially misused in any way? Uh, no, could there be a you know, uh, user that can schedule workloads across sockets in such a way that the bus is now flooded and the other container tenants now experience a slowdown? Or could a user now identify its vicinity from a peripheral such as a GPU and schedule themselves closer to get an undue latency advantage? You know, compared to the rest of the you know, uh, uh, compared to the rest of the workloads. So. Uh, so are there any uh, solutions that exist today that can help mitigate this problem of inconsistency of information? Uh, 
Well, it turns out uh, there are there are a few, and we've highlighted about it, about three of them. So one of the, the most obvious solutions that are there are, hey, just look at cgroupfs. So if you need information about the restrictions that are imposed on you, uh, just look at the interface that imposes those restrictions in the first place. And that's a very strong argument to make. Uh, however, a lot of these applications, legacy or otherwise, uh, rely on traditional interfaces like sys and proc. And uh, I'm asking all these play players to uh, really change the way they, uh, they, uh, they interpret information it may be a difficult task. Uh, another problem is also that you know uh, now these uh, applications also need to interpret newer concepts like uh, period and quota, which are CPU restrictions in time, uh, and but they are they are used to interpreting the, uh, information in terms of space and in terms of CPUs and threads. Uh, and how how does this information really need to be interpreted is 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 a is a difficult uh, uh, thing to uh, say. Uh, and lastly, while C groups can be used to extract information, uh, in in principle, they are a control mechanism for the host rather than a display interface inside the container. And uh, and there really doesn't uh, there really isn't anything that stops uh, uh, them to change this interface in the future. And uh, and maybe like a C group V3 comes out, and then the applications have to go uh, change the way they look at information all over again. Um, uh, so there are some user space innovations in this area as well. Uh, there's a user space solution called LXCFS uh, by, by the by the LXC uh, containers, and basically what they do is um, they, it's a user space file system that bind mounts over the existing sys and procfs, and they basically provide consistent information in accordance to whatever restrictions that were set on these applications. They're essentially trying to fake this information in in a way, right? Um, the advantage of a uh, user space innovation like this is that it's a very light easy to use user space tool and uh, we have we have seen a few articles uh, where it's currently being used uh, or currently being described by uh, by google and uh, alibaba as well uh, and and if a user space innovation uh, exists out there to solve solving this problem this kind of bolsters our confidence that this problem uh, you know exists in the first place uh, but a problem with user space innovations are that they need explicit setup for applications. And they need explicit setup for applications that experience this effect of incorrect information in the first place. So uh, so a lot of times inconsistent information is not going to really crash your application. It's, it's rather going to give you a, a performance hit or it's going to give you, uh, give, give you a problem that that's, is somewhat of a silent failure. And first identifying that you are facing this problem in the first place and then identifying that LXCFS is the right solution for you can be a bit of a hassle. Uh, lastly, uh, there, is, there, were, there, were, there was an effort uh, for an RFC patch set, which was posted a few months ago, which added um, a proc slash self slash meminfo as a new interface, which respects the C group restrictions and provides this consistent information uh, uh, for, for, for applications to see. And uh, this is a very good solution as it introduces standards for exposing and interpreting this information. It is also a very clean interface as it does not meddle with the current established sys and proc interfaces. And, uh, and it kind of uh, uh, keeps the sanctity of, uh, of those interfaces intact. However, um, just like cgroupfs, it also faces the problem of a uh, problem that a lot of applications still look at sys and proc uh, instead of uh, cgroup, and the motivation to use yet another interface may be a little bit low. Uh, there, there was a comment which kind of highlighted uh, of the same in the same path set as well, uh, which which I have uh, you know linked down um, on these things. Uh, so, what if we could have a solution that uh, kind of took some good points from all the three solutions and 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 build something around it uh, so what if we could present information about our restrictions uh, we could present them consistently with all these existing interfaces of sys and proc and we could introduce standardization of how to expose and interpret the solution by an in kernel solution introducing cpu namespace so we basically try to isolate uh, CPU information for each task based on whatever restrictions that have been applied to it via the control and, uh, and display interfaces. Uh, 
um and 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 we make that consistent with the rest of the interfaces as well so basically we isolate the cpu information by maintaining a, tra a translation of these cpus within the namespace and from the namespace piece cpu to a logical cpu we have scrambled the cpus to help mitigate the problems of the knowledge of topologies that we have highlighted in one of our previous slides i'm not an expert here but if it helps that uh, then then that's great uh, in our proof of concept we have scrambled this map just to show that a discontinuous cpu numbering works just just right out of the box. And if the map, if the mapping does matter, we can could change it to something like a zero to n map, or even make it as a one to one mapping, right? Um, but in summary, just like a PID namespace, when you view a task's CPU resources within a CPU namespace, uh, we can get an isolated view of the restrictions that it is bound by, and viewing the task's resources outside this namespace will yield the translations of these. So, for uh, for example, uh, if you look if you look at the diagram which is without the CPU namespace, which is basically uh, the one di the diagram that we saw uh, in one of our earlier slides, you can clearly see that uh, you know proc insists uh, you know weren't in weren't consistent in information when when there was a CPU set restriction applied to it. Uh, when we look at it from a CPU namespace point of view, while while when we add a CPU namespace layer to it, we can now see that a scrambled map is first generated, and uh, C group FS uh, view. Moving C group FS within this container now yields a translation of 5, 12, 21, 23. And similarly, all the all the system calls proc FS as well as SFS gives this uh, exact view to the system and which is in accordance to whatever restrictions that were applied to it. Of course, uh, this this namespace CPUs uh, is going to translate to uh, these real CPUs. So where 5, 12, 21, 20, uh, 23 is going to translate to 32, 33, 34, and 35. So basically, this is the design of what a CPU namespace is. Uh, the reference uh, link is also uh, is also on the top of this slide. Uh, where this is where we have posted the patches, and we have had quite a few interesting discussions um, on on this as well, which we will you know, discuss further uh, in the in the coming slides. So. Um, well, we, we, we showed that there is a problem of inconsistency of information, and we kind of showed with our solution that we kind of uh, have a, 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 a solution that elegantly brings together all these interfaces to solving this problem. Uh, but is there any performance benefit to doing this? As a spoiler alert, yes. Uh, in, in our experiment, we have run this on an IBM Power 9 machine on a 44 SMT4 containers on 176 CPUs. Uh, but these uh, experiments are architectural ag agnostic um, uh, as well. So our experiment is as follows. We benchmark Nginx, which is a HTTP server, and uh, which is a fairly modern HTTP server, if I may add. And uh, we benchmark it with a multi-threaded workload called Work, which is a a very simple HTTP load generator. Now, Nginx is configured with a worker processes auto, and this auto really helps us to enable this application to manage resources based on the system configuration that it sees. Uh, Nginx container is configured to CPU set to four CPUs, and the work benchmark spawns uh, about 500 requests in 30 seconds for four threads, which is enough to saturate uh, the, the, the resources of, uh, of four CPUs that we have bound our Nginx container by. Uh, on the right hand side, if you can see that there is a small summary graph of, of the percentage of improvement that uh, you really see uh, with this experiment. So we have, we have, we have a few metrics of measurements. Uh, first is the, is the memory usage at the initialization. And that, uh, when you compare it with a vanilla 5.14 kernel, you can see that it is dropped by about a 91%. Uh, uh, similarly, memory at peak drops at about 89%. Uh, throttle drops by about 74%. Latency drops by about 13%. And request per second uh, improves and incre or increases by about 20.73%. Um, we can clearly see that there is a net net uh, improvement in in providing consistent information uh, uh, to two applications. But uh, why is that? Uh, in the next slide, I aim to just uh, to answer just that. And uh, and basically, uh, if you look at the uh, topmost left side of it, which is the PIDs, you can see that uh, uh, on a vanilla kernel, it spawns about 177 uh, processes, whereas on a CPU namespace kernel, it just spawns about five. 177 is not a random number. Um, as we have seen before, uh, the system is configured to have about 176 CPUs. So basically, it spawns 176 worker threads plus one master thread. And in the, in the case of CPU namespace, it spawns four worker threads plus uh, uh, one master thread. And uh, as a result of that, or as a consequence of that, uh, the memory usage in the, in the 
vanilla kernel is pretty high because now it needs to allocate memory to to keep track of all these uh, extra pids uh, because of that also the throttle is uh, is pretty high and it's it's as high as about 97% of throttling and this is also because that now we are trying to run a very trying to uh, there are a lot of these resources who are trying to contend a uh, lot of these pids they are trying to contend for the same exact resource and that restored is resources quite constrained and therefore there is there is going to be quite a bit of throttling but even though there is throttling they are essentially trying to do the same thing uh, do the thing of the same task and uh, and there shouldn't be a lot of hit on the performance in in that case right uh, but that is not true uh, in, in that case you're going to be hit by uh, a scheduler overhead such as context switch and and that basically kind of shows us that the requests per second uh, or the throughput uh, uh, is quite higher in terms of our cpu namespace and uh, and our latency also uh, our latency goes lower which is uh, where where lower is better uh, in our cpu namespace as well and this is this is all because of these extra overheads that now that the application needs to really uh, uh, or the kernel really needs to uh, you know uh, handle so we 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 kind of showed that uh, there there is some benefit of doing uh, uh, of running these uh, of give, giving consistent information uh, you know the proof of the pudding is you know in re really eating it so let's let's show you our implementation of how we uh, really do cpu namespace and uh, just so that you have an idea that uh, uh, the idea that how it really works in the uh, linux kernel today so as you can see there are two tabs um, or, or, or in, in the in the terminal uh, the right hand side is basically the initial cpu namespace which is the host outside a container and the left hand side is the cpu namespace a um, just a is an as an acronym uh, within a container like docker right uh, on the left hand side we basically start a very simple ubuntu containers uh, with a bash prompt and uh, we we name it say p example and uh, and we, we we run it unconstrained so when we do an ls cpu we should see uh, you should see all this uh, cpus that uh, that exist on the system um similarly if you should do a cat of uh, you no know, cpu set dot cpus in the c group uh, fs directory you will also see the entire list of cpus now when we try to restrict this containers uh, cpu set and we will try to restrict it with the docker update command and we'll restrict it to cpu set 0 to 3 uh, in this case now when we do an ls cpu now you can see that there are only four cpus that uh, that exist on the system and uh, and the online uh, cpus is a scrambled map of of, of four uh, you know randomized uh, cpus of course uh, there are there are a few things like you no know, numa numa node 0 and numa node 8 which is not uh, really virtualized uh, in information or 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 it's not really uh, as uh, shown in in its in its true scrambled map but uh, this is a proof of concept and uh, you know we aim to have a a, a more fully fledged uh, 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 we, we aim to fully fledged fledge this out um so next you know same thing if we if we try to look at the c group cpu set interface basically it shows us that this information is also consistent with whatever ls cpu saw and it is uh, it is basically just these four cpus in a in a scrambled uh, way uh next we try to spawn uh, a stress on one of these available cpus and we'll task set it to uh, one of our available cpus that that is cpu 17 and we stress set to minus c1 which is just to you know cpu is to one cpus and we can do a task set minus cp to that task to see whatever the current affinity of that task is and we can clearly see that it is uh, now 17 which means that the system call is also coherent uh, coherently showing this uh, information if we do a top on to on top of this uh, you can see that uh, now it uh, according to this container it has only four cpus and uh, cpu 17 is what is uh, consuming uh, 100% of uh, you know utilization uh on, on on the similar side if you if you try to look at the same information from outside this container if you try to view this task affinity from outside this container we can do a top and you know we can see what what consumes 100% of cpu time that is cpu 0 uh and if you try to do this with this with the with the task set minus cp by getting the p uh, you know ps minus uh, ef of grep stress uh, where of course you are now going to get like two tasks one is the parent and the child so parent really spawns the stressor and we can really look at either the parent of the child uh, to see where it is really uh, uh, bounded by uh, you can clearly see that the task set minus cp is uh, really um, showing us to be that it is bounded to cpu 0 uh, next uh, if we try to change this affinity to say cpu 2 which is which is again in the permissible limit of whatever cpu set restrictions we have applied to it uh, 
so if we toss it to uh, you know cpu2 uh, uh, we can uh, we can try to see how this uh, sh- you know varies this information uh, in in the top command uh, on both uh, within the container and outside the container so with the outside the container you, you can now see that cpu2 shows 100% uh, utilization and within the container it uh, the, it has now migrated from cpu17 uh, to cpu83 so so that is pretty much uh, you know w- w- what it is and uh, in in the next slide we will talk about a few challenges and and you know what is the future of of isolation of uh, of information so while the solution uh, works in a way uh, but it is not perfect and and there are a few challenges associated with it one of the most uh, foremost challenges that that exist with this is that until now namespaces and c groups have been fairly disjoint from one another uh, cpu namespace uh, kind of breaks that and without cpu or cpu set c groups the cpu namespace itself loses its meaning and uh, that uh, brings up the question really that if uh, that is it time to now uh, uh, define interactions between uh, namespaces and c groups uh, in, in a in a in a um, you know it's reasonable amount of way and and what does you know what do containers really mean from that point onwards um another uh, challenge that that exists with our current design is that the current design only addresses restrictions in space which is uh, you know cpus and threads and pids and so on uh, but not uh, time uh, and not pids by the way uh, uh, the containers also frequently use uh, cf uh, periods and quotas and, and then it's uh, you know fondly called millicodes in the kubernetes world and in the cloud world um, so how does this information now need to be exposed for this these restrictions it can be as simple as some defining some standards that say that okay th- th- if this is the ratio of period and quota this is the um, uh, this is the cpu's worth of runtime but then uh, is ratios the only uh, factor uh, for that or not um l- lastly while cpu namespace uh, mitigates potential misuse stemming from knowledge of topology by obfuscation of information the topology can still be roughly figured out if uh, you know with ipi latencies to determine uh, who's your sibling or who's uh, or which core is really far away uh, uh, from you so that's that brings us uh, to a last slide of of future uh, where uh, you know the intention of uh, of this uh, of of this presentation is to spark a discussion on the problem rather than be the know all and end all of all solutions um, if the solution is uh, for applications to change and look at c group fs or any other interface uh, there are a few exciting discussions that are happening around exporting more useful metrics to entice applications to change and these were discussions were happening on the um, uh, Uh, on the patch set that i had posted um if the solution is an external user space program bind mounting like custom sys and proc fs then should that be the norm for the future as well now should should uh, should, uh, should user space innovations uh, be encouraged further or should we start looking at uh, you know uh, defining and standardizing uh, a, a lot of these things uh, for, for you know within the linux kernel itself and finally is it a uh, time uh, to you know uh, finally define uh, a, a container as a first class object uh, in linux so that was pretty much all the questions i had the, the, this is a legal slide uh, for uh, uh, for attributions and uh, and finally some references so thank you for uh, for this i will look at uh, if there are any questions around it and uh, and uh, i will try to i'll try my best to answer them yeah Go so ahead, the first question the fir- yeah the first question is uh, does the numa map of uh, the name spaced cpu still correspond to the hardware so in the current implementation that pratik has uh, it does not so we have not taken that into consideration but the idea is if we still want to you know do this whole permutation thing then we can restrict the permutation to uh, the numa uh, node so that uh, you know we are consistent at least with respect to numa but but we i, I if we are going for a random permutation we will still not be consistent with other topological information such as last level caches and uh, uh, smt siblings for, for instance uh, yeah the next question is uh, why scramble the cpus rather than just showing you know 0 to 4 or in general i think 0 to 3 is what meant what was meant here since there are four cpus now we could, we can we can easily do that i mean we pick the most uh, uh, generic permutation that one could think of but it is 
very easily possible to you know redefine this map to be just you know zero to n or or if if that is not preferable we can just have a one to one map where you know whatever the host sees it's the same cpus that you know we see inside the container as well so it's just an implementational detail uh, it's it's a it's a matter of choice so pratik you want to add anything to that no no i think you're absolutely right so it's just a, it's just a matter of implementation details and uh, and that was pretty much the first thing that i implemented uh, so like i also said before right uh, this could uh, easily be as a 0 to 3 map or or a 1 to 1 map as well right uh, it just show you the whatever cpus that you really have okay uh, this one more question uh, which, which asks is the idea that you would scramble the cpu ids numa node ids together uh, in some way where where the cpus on the same numa node will still appear on the same numa node inside the container uh, yes that 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 is the eventual idea uh, but but it, it is not present in the current implementation so current implementation for instance if you say take two cpus uh, uh, five and say 130 which happen to be these are real cpu numbers which happen to be in different numa ids when you use it inside the container they may still get you know some numbers like uh, 10 and 11 uh, which inside the container you know map to the same uh, same numa uh, numa id so uh, that is something that we need to fix when we are setting this permutation so currently i think we are taking all the cpus and then we are Uh, defining a permutation at the start of the container that could be anything to anything, but then we can partition these and have these permutations within those numa nodes. That's that's possible. Uh, there's one more question: CPU scrambling hides topology information from the container, but doesn't that mean that apps that try and optimize their access patterns for numa will actually be anti-optimized for memory access? That is true. that is true. and uh, like like i said and it's it's something that we had not taken care in our current implementation but it's not very hard to do that any other questions uh, any comments because what we are really looking for is is feedback since there are user space solutions there are alternative you know kernel uh, solutions what would be the right way forward uh, you know to provide the consistent information to to, to applications running inside kernel what user space pieces are responsible for setting up the cpu mappings i am assuming that this question uh, you know is restricted to our implementation of uh, cpu namespace so pratik you want to take that what user space pieces are responsible for setting up the cpu mappings today um so uh, responsible for cpu mappings is nothing much uh, really we 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 expose this by uh, by a clone system call and uh, we we have just defined a new system call uh, uh, or we just defined a new flag in this clone system call where whereas if you if you call a clone new cpu uh, you are you are basically going to get a new cpu namespace and uh, these these are these are automatically going to be mapped at the start of creating this cpu namespace so yeah in addition to i mean that the clone is something that in our current implementation it it uh, it is set by default whenever a, a pid namespace is asked for so right so that that's a hack uh, but uh, apart from that there is nothing that the user space currently needs to do for our implementation in order to get you know this restricted information because that is exposed through proc and sys and uh, utilities such as top anyway read this information so the the idea is to present consistent information proxies c group fs and uh, system calls such as set and get affinity Yeah, it's a hack only because that uh, you know we we want to use your, all these pre-made utilities like Docker uh, to really get, get get going. Of course, you 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 can uh, you can write your own C programs and call your clone system calls and and get uh, get the same thing up and running as well. Right. Uh, yeah, we still have a minute. We can we can take any questions or comments. Yeah. Yep. We've still got uh, about one minute. So if anyone has any has one last question to put in, 
Oh, we've got one coming in. The question is, uh, once the CPU name space is unshared, how are the additions or removals or renumberings of the CPUs controlled? Okay. Uh, so, so yeah sure uh, so basically uh, uh, when when so these are these are basically virtual sort of mappings right uh, they don't really matter uh, it, they only matter in the sense of that namespace itself and when you when you unshare it uh, those those mappings just go away and uh, and and uh, of course uh, the, the 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 tasks that are that have been running in those mappings now are mapped to the translations or the or the real numberings uh, of whatever uh, physical CPUs or, or logical CPUs in, in terms of Linux uh, is really really mapped to. So so they will see the entire system. I mean, if you add a new CPU, uh, you will they, they they'll see the you know the permutation that has been assigned to that new CPU. When you remove a CPU, for instance, uh, uh, then then that number goes away. And if you if you unshare the entire namespace, I think the current implementation would give whatever the host would see. So it would yes. just get rid of the That's right. permutation. Well, I think that brings us to the uh, end of our time slot. So thank you very much to uh, Pratik and Gautam for their talk. Um, and that brings us to afternoon tea. Uh, so we'll be taking a 30 minute break until the next talk, which will be uh, Alice Ferrazzi uh, talking about merging an existing framework into kernel CI. Uh, that will be coming up at 3.40 PM. Uh, see you all then. Have a good afternoon tea. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.